As we begin our discussions of anatomy and physiology, we will primarily focus on humans. However, there are some intriguing examples in nature of variable anatomy and physiology examples that we will be sure to give you as well as we go along. We need to start out thinking about complexity of animals, how we build structure, and how we use that structure to perform particular functions. So when we look at anatomy and physiology, the big difference is with anatomy, we're going to study the parts. Basically, it's a how-to guide to your body. But if you want to actually look at physiology, you have to start to think about how those structures work together and actually become integrated into the whole. For our discussions, we will focus primarily on the anatomy. However, we will occasionally pull in some of the physiology so that it makes more sense to you why organs are aligned the way they are, why they're connected to other organs the way they are, and why that function is so important. We have mentioned the idea before of form follows function. So when we look at an organism being shaped a particular way, having particular physical characteristics, we certainly have to think about the environment in which they live, why they might have a particular form, like why are sharks and seals and penguins streamlined? Why are they kind of torpedo shaped compared to you? I am sure you are an excellent swimmer, but I bet you can't outswim them. Why not? Well, how does your environment drive the adaptations and the evolution of characteristics that would make you better adapt to that environment? Have you ever seen a penguin walk around on land? It's pretty hysterical, right? So how is that driven by the environment in which they live, their appearance, how they behave, and then how does it affect their physiology? What is it about the functioning of the structures and organs and organ systems that are Im directly impacted by that environment and what they're trying to deal with on a daily basis? So remember, when we talk about tissues, this is a group of cells with a similar function. So we're going to look at tissues when we talk through about skin and muscle and fat and all of these kinds of things. Organs have a very specific task. We really can look at most organs as being unitaskers. So why did such a specific task and how can they accomplish it? Well, they do it by being made up of more than one type of tissue. Organ systems, as the name sort of implies, are going to be multiple organs. that perform an overall vital body function. So we look at digestive systems. We look at cardiovascular systems. Both of these are going to be made up of multiple organs and many types of tissues to achieve their goal and what they need to accomplish. So when we build from cellular up through to the organism itself, which the organism is just many organ systems functioning together, we have to consider how this is going to actually be built to achieve the complexity that is necessary for the organism to function properly. So with tissues, we will talk about four main categories of tissues, epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. These are all, remember, similar types of cells make up tissues, right? And these tissues are going to build into organs. 
So we're going to need multiple functions in these organs. So how many of the different tissue types are we going to have to use to build a given organ? And we'll see this as we go through. When we look at epithelial tissue, this is primarily associated with linings or coverings. So we talk about covering body surfaces. I'm hoping the first thing that comes to mind for you is skin. Skin is technically an organ, but it's made up of many epithelial tissues. And when we look at the other option or the other application of epithelials, we often look at linings. So like the lining of your stomach, we see these all over the place. When we look at epithelial tissues, they actually come in three different shapes. So the cells that make up these tissues, we can have three different kinds of cells making up epithelial tissue. Squamous, this looks a lot like a fried egg, if you know what I mean by that, kind of the off sort of shape with a big bump in the middle. What do you think that big bump in the middle is? Nucleus. Cuboidal, well, it's as it sounds. It's a cube. They're three-dimensional, so we have to take that into consideration. But it's a cube. Columnar, what's a column? Well, it's tall. Right? So the true definition is taller than they are wide. It's a rectangle, right? And again, would be three dimensional. We'll look at these in different places in your body and why the different shapes are so important for the function that that particular tissue needs to do for that organ. They're named based on how they are put together and the shape of the cells. We just showed you that. So when we look at the shape of the cells, it actually focuses on what we call the apical surface. Where do you think your apical surface would be? Some of you know apical from plants. If you know plants, we talk about an apical bud in plants. Where is that bud located? At the top. So when we talk about apical surfaces, we talk about surfaces, the top surface. So here I've got it labeled for you as the apical surface. So here are our squamous cells, cuboidal. Now yes, I understand they have these cubes in a tube shape for you, but the cells themselves are cubes. And then the columnar that we mentioned. We've got some weird ones too. We've got something known as stratified squamous. And these are just plain squamous cells, but they're in layers. You see this? This is like your skin. So the outer ones would be the ones that would peel off if you get a sunburn. And you've still got plenty of cells underneath to protect you. Pseudostratified pseudo ciliated columnar. It's a really long name, isn't it? Now. Pseudo means false or fake, right? So why are these fake stratified? That seems weird. Well, it has to do with the fact that you see where the nuclei are here? It gives the appearance of having some sort of layering, but there is no layer. These are single layers of cells. They just stack together and pack together very, very tightly, all right? And you might also notice that at the tops, if you can see it, there are a lot of cilia. So we'll look at where these types of cells are extremely important in your body as we go. They have them labeled here for you associated with the bronchi, but we'll look at other locations too that they might be important. Connective tissue holds everything together. So loose connective is actually associated with more places on your body than any of the other connective tissues, very widespread throughout your system. And we look at it containing a lot of collagen. So very, very elastic, very strong. And this actually connects your skin 
to the tissues underneath. So it holds your skin on. That's pretty important. Fibrous connective tissue is densely packed collagen. And we usually form these in tendons, use them primarily there to attach muscle to bone. So that needs to be a pretty strong attachment point, right? Other connective tissues, we have adipose tissue or fat, found pretty much everywhere, right? Cartilage, associated with skeletal structures again. Bone, of course, and when we look at bone, we're going to look at the calcification of a matrix of a collagen matrix. So you see kind of a repeating theme here with the collagen a lot, right? Blood is a liquid, right? So how is it possible that this is a connective tissue? It's connective because it transports throughout the entire body. So it's connecting pretty much everything. Muscle tissue, three types that we focus on in vertebrates. Skeletal, of course, associated with your skeletal system, um, and is voluntary. Cardiac, heart, involuntary. And smooth muscle, Smooth is associated with your internal organs, and again, involuntary. Their structures are different. We will look at that because if muscles are going to be voluntary versus involuntary, they're going to have to be interacting with your nervous system very differently. So we will look at that later on. Nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is primarily responsible for sensing or being part of your sensory system and transmitting information. The neurons themselves are actually the basic functional unit of a nerve. And we'll look into that. And that's what's actually going to carry signal. There are other cells that support neur neurons that are part of this nervous tissue, and we actually look at them as being an insulator. And we look at them as supplying nutrients to the neurons. So these will play a very important role in keeping the nerve healthy and happy and conducting signals properly. This is one cell. So we have to think about this as the cell body in the center sending out all kinds of proteins to all of the rest of itself. That's going to be a very important point for us to keep track of. We will look at all of these different types of tissues as we go through the organs and think about their function in each organ.